Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. Today we'll be discussing the publicly traded company Novonics Group. When production starts this year in Tennessee for their pure graphite anode, Novonics will be the first manufacturer of synthetic graphite in North America. However, there's more to the story than that. Novonics is lining up a series of products to become a one-stop shop for low-cost, long-cycle life battery materials that are more environmentally friendly. This video will cover Novonics market potential, their products, and how those products might help battery producers de-risk their supply chains. Before we begin, a special thanks to Bradford Ferguson of Halter Ferguson Financial and the Patreon supporters listed in the credits. It's the support from Patreon that keeps me grinding away on interesting niche topics. Back to Novonics. Much of the commentary around Novonics has focused on the links that Novonics has to Tesla through its chief operating officer, Chris Burns. Chris Burns worked under Tesla's battery research partner, Jeff Don, and he also worked directly for Tesla for two years. I'm tackling the Tesla connection right out of the gate because I don't think that Novonics needs Tesla, nor does Tesla need Novonics for either company to grow an order of magnitude or more over the next decade. There are two reasons for this. First, let's look at the demand picture for Novonics. By 2030, analysts expect 2 terawatt hours a year of global battery production. And as each year passes, analysts are raising their forecasts. 2 terawatt hours of battery production will require 2 million tons of graphite anode material per year. Depending on which analyst you check with, this could be predominantly synthetic or predominantly natural graphite. Regardless, both synthetic and natural appear poised for growth at an order of magnitude or more. My view is that both natural and synthetic have their place in the market, and the last video in this anode series will compare these two materials in depth. Second, let's look at the supply side for Novonics. Novonics plans to be producing 100,000 tons of anode per year in 2030. The entire global production of batteries in 2019 required 160,000 tons of anode material for 160 gigawatt hours of production. Let that sink in. One penny stock from Australia expects to be producing 100,000 tons of anode in 2030, which is 63% of 2019 global production. Novonics is a small fish that will grow into a big fish if they can execute on their plan and hit the production cost targets discussed in the last video. In other words, Novonics doesn't need Tesla. Third, Tesla is a big fish already and they usually make agreements with suppliers that can provide ridiculous quantities of materials. This is why Tesla works with the largest players in the game, like Gonfung and Glencore. In other words, Tesla doesn't need Novonics. However, if Tesla did purchase battery materials from Novonics, how could this be worked into Tesla's supply chain? As we'll see when we get into Novonics products, they'll offer both anode and cathode battery materials. These materials aren't interchangeable in batteries. This is because materials from different suppliers and sources have different shapes and internal structures at the particle level. Batteries are designed around the specific characteristics of the materials provided by each supplier. As for anode, Tesla's Giga Nevada most likely uses a blend of synthetic and natural anode. They don't manufacture this themselves and purchase that blend from a supplier. The company that supplies that blend to Giga Nevada would have to incorporate Novonics into that blend. That supplier would have spent years developing and testing that blend. They could make changes to the blend, but I'm assuming there would need to be a very good reason for the change, and it would take time to implement. As for cathode, Novonics will be manufacturing single crystal cathode. However, it's still in the development stage. Production is expected to start ramping for single crystal cathode in two years. Then, it will take a couple of years after that to ramp volume significant enough to interest Tesla. In other words, if Novonics does sell single crystal cathode to Tesla, it'll be some years away. I've also heard speculation that Tesla could acquire Novonics. I'll provide my own speculation here. If Tesla were to buy Novonics, it would mean Tesla is going into battery raw materials processing there doesn't seem to be a persuasive reason for Tesla to do this. I do agree that Tesla might partner on a mine to secure raw materials at a fixed price, 
but that doesn't require purchasing the companies that process the raw materials between the mine and the factory. In other words, partnering on a mine to capture supply is low touch, whereas getting into materials processing might overcomplicate their business model. The fact that Tesla hasn't made a play for Novonix yet doesn't tell us anything. One could argue that it takes years for anode producers to prove themselves, so we wouldn't expect an acquisition by Tesla at this early stage. One could also argue that Tesla typically buys out a company when they have a technology that Tesla wants, even if that technology hasn't been scaled yet. This is a strong counter-argument as to why we should have seen an acquisition already. With that said, what if Tesla did start processing their own raw materials? They wouldn't necessarily have to acquire Novonix. As stated in the last video on dry particle microgranulation, or DPMG, the machine that Novonix uses for their patented DPMG process is widely available. The patent is for the process rather than the machine. I asked Chris Burns if he would be open to licensing the technology, and he responded that they're exploring this idea. DPMG can also be used in the production of fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, toners, pigments, fillers, and catalysts. If they chose not to license the technology to their competitors in the battery industry or Tesla, they could instead profit by licensing DPMG to other industries. One last note on the Tesla connection. Sanyo is a Panasonic company, and Panasonic is a supplier to Tesla. Sanyo has signed a non-binding Memorandum of Understanding to assess Novonix materials. This MOU was a result of positive test results carried out by Sanyo on Novonix materials. To me, this means it may take some time before Sanyo takes a bigger bite of the Novonix apple. The image on screen is for cathode material, where it usually takes five to eight months to qualify material in a best case scenario. The process for a battery manufacturer to qualify anode materials can take 18 months. This is because anode material can be much more variable than cathode material in terms of consistency, and therefore it takes longer to qualify anode material. This means it could be a year or two before Sanyo signs a purchase agreement. With that said, Novonix was able to complete the anode qualification process with Samsung SDI in 11 months including time for contract negotiation. We don't know how far along Sanyo is with the anode qualification process, or if Sanyo is just waiting to see how the scaling ramp goes for Novonix. Regardless, things are looking good so far, and it appears to be a matter of time and effort before Sanyo signs a purchase agreement with Novonix. If Novonix did sign an agreement with Tesla, Sanyo, Panasonic, or other Tier 1 battery manufacturers, I asked Chris if Novonix could scale more quickly. I asked this question because in 2030, I expect Tesla to need 2 million tons of anode material per year rather than 100,000. His response was as follows. As you know, large factories can consume 30,000 plus tons per year. So if we have the opportunity to become suppliers to a few of these facilities, we would need to ramp faster. For the stock bugs, how much revenue will Novonix be capable of in 2030 at 100,000 tons per year? I'm not a financial analyst. This is just information to get you started if you'd like to do some analysis. Please do your own due diligence before investing in any company. The price of synthetic anode averages $13,000 per ton. Novonix has modeled a production cost of $5,000 per ton for their synthetic graphite. This leaves $8,000 per ton after production costs. If Novonix expects to be producing 100,000 tons of anode per year in 2030, this would come to $800 million a year after production costs. This doesn't include potential revenue from Novonix other products, and it also doesn't factor in inflation, which means we can expect the numbers to be higher if everything goes according to plan. Let's take a closer look at Novonix product line. Novonix has three primary battery materials in the pipeline with the goal of providing the three key battery materials required for a million mile battery. These materials are the cathode, anode, and electrolyte. The Novonix single crystal cathode material was just unveiled in June. It's in development and moving to pilot scale. Everything I noted earlier about the potential market size for anode material is also true for cathode material. In fact, the numbers probably work out better for DPMG cathode versus DPMG graphite anode. This is for three reasons. 
First, cathode is a more expensive product than anode material. Cathode costs twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars per ton versus six to eighteen thousand dollars per ton for anode material. Second, the cathode production process has more opportunities for efficiency. This image illustrates the simplicity of the DPMG process versus a typical CSTR process for manufacturing cathode. The DPMG process has a 100% yield rate and is a dry process. The CSTR process involves a large amount of chemical and material waste and typically uses 99,000 liters of water a day. Several people have asked me what the difference is between Maxwell dry battery electrode technology and Novonix dry particle microgranulation. Maxwell dry battery electrode is an electrode production process, whereas Novonix dry particle microgranulation is the process that makes the materials that go into battery electrodes. Third, the DPMG process can use class II nickel oxide. Typical CSTR processes require class I nickel sulfate. Class II nickel looks to be at least 30% cheaper than class I. Nickel is the most expensive part of the cathode and makes up almost 45% of the material cost of cathodes. This means a shift to class II nickel could reduce the total cost of a battery cell by around 8% if we assume a 30% reduction in cost of the nickel in the cathode. There's been a lot of speculation that because Novonix has a patent for single crystal cathode and Tesla is looking at using single crystal cathode in their batteries, that Novonix will be supplying single crystal cathode to Tesla. My view is that if Tesla is using single crystal cathode in any chemistry revealed on battery day, supply would have been secured earlier this year or last year. As stated earlier, Novonix cathode materials are still two years away from production and probably another two years after that for production at large scale. In other words, I don't expect Tesla to be using Novonix single crystal cathode in the near future. While we're on the topic, Tesla may be able to source single crystal cathode from other suppliers if they decide to include it in the battery that we expect to be unveiled on battery day. For example, Jeff Don used off-the-shelf single crystal cathode pouch cells from China for the Million Mile Battery Research paper. However, the question is, in the long term, who can make this material cheap enough to make it commercially viable? There are several competing methods, and DPMG could take the crown. Next, the synthetic pure graphite anode. The image on screen gives a clear indication of how pure graphite compares to two different types of synthetic and one type of natural graphite. Based on the products in the table, pure graphite looks like the best value in terms of synthetic graphite. The value proposition for natural graphite is very different. The value proposition for synthetic and natural graphite will be discussed in depth in the final video of this series. There's a reason why Tesla is most likely using a blend of synthetic and natural, and there are also reasons why that might change. Synthetic anode requires a huge amount of energy to crystallize the raw materials into graphite, which is the primary source of CO2 emissions from manufacturing synthetic anode. Pure Graphite is balancing that out by building their plant in Tennessee, where the electricity is cheap and green hydroelectric power. We'll come back to this in a moment. Finally, the development of Novonix Electrolyte products is ongoing. As you can see, they already have two electrolyte packages. I expect they'll offer more products in the future. For example, at some point in the next 5 to 10 years, we may see high voltage electrolyte packages or electrolyte packages targeted at pure lithium anodes. Even without those innovations, I expect further electrolyte optimizations to extend battery life and reduce cost. How do these materials perform? This chart speaks for itself. For reference, I assume 4,000 cycles with a 250 mile battery pack is how Tesla defines a million mile battery. The cathode used in this graph uses a commercial, non-Novonix single crystal cathode. Chris is advised that this single crystal cathode is representative of Novonix minimum performance targets for their cathode program. With that stand-in cathode, a Novonix synthetic anode, and Novonix electrolyte, the battery cell appears to hit 1.5 million miles. Novonix used 330 miles as the base range. 1.5 million divided by 330 is 4,545 cycles. 
Novonics' example battery appears to be right in line with Jeff Don's million mile benchmark chemistry. Bear in mind this is Novonics' minimum target, and we might see better numbers with Novonics' single crystal cathode. Let's talk about what I consider is most important about Novonics. If Novonics missed its price targets and only managed to hit price parity with competitors, it still offers something that'll attract buyers. Working with Novonics will de-risk the supply chains of its customers in three primary ways. First is geopolitical risk. In 2020, it's finally dawned on Western countries that over the past 40 years, they've opened their flank to China and are vulnerable to Chinese control through manufacturing. For governments, they're in a weak bargaining position if they're dependent on China for strategic products and resources. For corporations, China has a stranglehold in many areas of production. If there's a conflict between the government of the country they operate in and China, they run the risk of being collateral damage in trade wars. China has essentially captured the anode market. Novonics claims that they can compete head-on with Chinese products, providing a product that's better value for money. Although Novonics synthetic anode is more expensive than Chinese synthetic anode, it's cheaper than Japanese synthetic anode. It's safer than Chinese anode, has higher energy density, loses less of its capacity, has longer cycle life, and has higher safety and reliability. Second, localization. The closer that suppliers are to your factory, the more agile your company can be with its supply chain and the better you can monitor those suppliers. Novonics will operate out of the U.S. and supply two companies in the U.S. Their Chattanooga, Tennessee manufacturing facility is centrally located and has access to major freight corridors to every part of the country. This improves integration with rail and trucking routes. And finally, Chinese synthetic anode material is not environmentally friendly. Synthetic anode is made from petroleum and coal byproducts. Chinese coal mining is notoriously dirty. Furthermore, synthetic anode is energy intensive to produce because the raw material is heated to 3000 degrees Celsius. Chinese power production is 64% coal-fired. Novonics will be using hydroelectric power to produce their anode. Thanks to DPMG, Novonics will also generate very little toxic waste due to the 100% efficiency of their process. As mentioned in the last video, the conventional method for producing cathode produces toxic waste that contains toxic metals. In China, this waste is often dumped untreated back into the environment. Customers will be looking ever more closely at the materials that go into their vehicles as they become more educated. This slide makes it clear the impact that those materials make. This is a VW EV versus VW internal combustion vehicle. It'll be some time before there is enough competition and data in the market to influence EV buyer decision making based on how much CO2 is used to produce the vehicle. However, if you're a battery producer, it's better to get ahead of this and secure green production materials now. In summary, demand for battery materials over the next decade will grow by more than an order of magnitude. Novonics intends to ride that wave and ramp a supply of high-quality anode material that's competitive with China. The production ramp for that anode material is starting now. The anode production will act as a flywheel to launch the single crystal cathode material, which will potentially offer higher profitability. If they are successful, they'll have the entire field to themselves in the North American synthetic anode market and potentially European synthetic anode market. The pure graphite anode may then act as a flywheel to launch the single crystal cathode product. Novonics invests heavily in battery R&D programs with Mark Obervac and also has internal R&D programs in Halifax for cell assembly and testing. This R&D backbone has already provided an innovative product line and we can expect further high-end products to keep Novonics competitive. Finally, the kicker is that it's in the best interest of companies to localize their supply away from China and move towards greener products. I expect they will out of necessity, competitiveness, and for the sake of their public image. In the next video, I'll be covering Tolga Resources, which has some exciting prospects for natural graphite in the European market. The video after that will cover synthetic versus natural anode and summarize everything we've learned in the series on graphitic battery anode materials. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video 
or snag something off the merch shelf below. I'm also active on Twitter and Reddit. You can find the details of those in the description, and I look forward to hearing from you. A special thanks to Inku Chris Kong and Aaron Scheiveler for your generous support of the channel and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.